Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So like I said in last week's video, today I wanted to go ahead and make a video about a cold case that was solved so many years after the crime had occurred. But before we get into the video, I just wanted to go ahead and give a quick shout out to my patrons, Simone, Sean, Emma, and KF. Thank you all so, so much for signing up for my Patreon. You guys are literally the reason that I can keep my channel going. I cannot even begin to express how much I appreciate your guys' support and how much your support means to me. Again, thank you all for being a part of this channel and I appreciate every single one of you. Now with that being said, let's get into today's case. Today we are going to be discussing the solved case of the Racine County Jane Doe or better known as Peggy Lynn Johnson. So of course this video is not going to go how my videos normally go. Today I'm going to jump straight into the day that her body was found and the events leading up to identifying her and finding out who is responsible for her murder. On July 21st, 1999, a father and his daughter were walking their dog along 92nd Street in the town of Raymond between Six Mile Road and Seven Mile Road in Racine County. County, Wisconsin, when they stumbled upon the body of a young woman in a cornfield about 25 feet away from the street. The body appeared to belong to a woman who had been beaten and she looked incredibly malnourished. She was wearing clothes that clearly did not look like they belonged to her. She was wearing a gray men's western style button-up shirt with a red embroidered floral pattern on it and black sweatpants with no shoes or socks on. Upon examining her body, it was discovered that she she had died within one day of her body being discovered. The man who discovered the body walked this route every single day so he knew that her body was not there the previous day. In addition to that, it had rained just after the body had been placed there, which had washed away a lot of the evidence that could have been found, and this also helped determine when she was placed there. So of course, after the body was discovered, she was taken in for an autopsy, and this autopsy showed just how much this woman suffered before her death. So like I said, it was very evident that she was malnourished. In addition to that, she showed signs of long-term neglect and abuse, which seemed to have gotten significantly worse in the days prior to her death. There was bruising all over her face and upper torso. There were chemical burns to about 25% of her body, which were all at different stages of healing and different levels of severity. Another finding was that she had cauliflower ear. Now, this is a deformity that's commonly seen in wrestlers, and it can happen from repeated trauma like being pulled or as a result of being beaten to her head. To me, it was seemed like it was caused from repetitive trauma since she did show signs of a penetration wound from a sharp object on that same ear. They found four lacerations to the backside of her head that appeared to be the result of blunt force trauma that broke through all layers of her scalp, but did not go as deep as penetrating her skull. She had a broken nose with swelling on both sides which indicated that this was a recent injury. Her lips were cut open on both ends. It was also obvious that she had severe road rash all the way from her pubic area to her chest, probably from being dragged. She also had an open wound on her elbow that was severely infected. These injuries appeared to be pre-mortem, so before death, and some were older injuries, while injuries such as the broken nose, the ear wound, and head injuries all seemed to be within three to five days before her death. They also found that she had several broken ribs on both sides of her rib cage that appeared to be post-mortem. Ultimately, the coroner determined the cause of death to be homicide by sepsis pneumonia as a result of infection from the injuries sustained from chronic abuse. Absolutely horrific. They also found some evidence that suggested that she may have had a cognitive disability. She was around 5 feet 8 inches tall, weighing about 120 pounds, and was thought to be between the ages of 18 to 35 years old. Her front incisors protruded out of her mouth, and a lot of teeth showed signs of decay, with some of them missing, so this indicated that she didn't have very good dental health before her death. She had shoulder-length, reddish-brownish curly hair with some blonde highlights. Both of her ears were double-pierced, and it looked as if she had worn glasses during her life, but there were not any glasses found with her body. At this point, investigators had absolutely no idea who this woman could have been, so for the time being, she was labeled as Racine County Jane Doe. On October 27th, 1999, there was a funeral held for Racine County Jane Doe, and she was buried at the Holy Family Cemetery in Caledonia, Wisconsin. Her gravestone read, Daughter, Jane Doe. 
gone but not forgotten. Investigators initially thought that this young woman was possibly a runaway who was estranged from her family and that is why she wasn't reported missing as far as they saw. Or they thought that maybe she was a tourist from another country and that she just wasn't in the system because of that. They tried their best to identify her and figure out who was responsible for her death but like I said, there was very little evidence. Unfortunately, it had rained just after she was placed there which washed away a lot of the evidence that could have possibly been there. And, like I always say, DNA technology back then just was not where it is today. Like I said in my last video, the only real evidence they had was the fact that Racine County Jane Doe looked remarkably like Andrea Bowman. But, like we saw, Kathy, her biological mother, submitted her DNA, but it came back as to not being her. There were also other victims that police tried to connect her case to. Mary Kate Camizo was discovered in Lake County, Illinois. She had similar injuries to Racine County Jane Doe. She was malnourished, she had decaying teeth, she had been beaten, and she had a cognitive disability. But ultimately, throughout her case, they found nothing of substance that pointed directly towards any one suspect. At that point, the best that they could do was put her face out there and hope that someone would recognize her and come forward to identify her. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children it came out with a reconstruction of what she probably looked on based on what she looked like post-mortem, but again, they were not able to identify her. Then, on October 16th, 2013, Racine County Jane Doe's body was exhumed for further testing. This decision was not an easy one, but it was ultimately made because there was new technology that could give investigators further information about her life in the weeks, months, and even years leading up to her death. They were hoping that this information could maybe even identify her and give them more momentum towards figuring out who was responsible for her death. They used a sample of bone and hair to study the isotopic makeup of her bone to show where she lived before her death. It's actually really interesting how this whole thing works. So, studying these isotopes can give you information about how your ancestors used their natural environments to find, produce, and eat food. Certain foods will show up in different ways within the collagen of your bones in humans and animals. For example, and I'm mostly using examples from the U.S. because I know much more about how the food works in our country versus different countries, but this also applies to pretty much anywhere in the world. But let's say someone had a heavy diet of fish and seafood. You might gather that they are from a coastal area such as Maine or Louisiana since the ocean is right there and a lot of them eat a lot of fish and seafood. If someone eats a lot more corn products, you might think that maybe they're from the Midwest since that is where a lot of the country's corn is produced. Again, our bodies can tell us so much about pretty much everything that we do. They initially did not release the results of these studies because they did not want to hurt the integrity of the investigation, but by October of 2016, authorities announced that from the isotope testing, they thought that she may have been originally from or spent several years of her life in Alaska, Montana, or southern parts of Canada. I'm not exactly sure how they found this out, but they also revealed that her murderer may have either been from New Hampshire or New Jersey. It's all very interesting things that they were able to come up with just based on this bone and hair sample. Then, after doing all these tests on July 19th, 2015, her body was reburied under her original headstone. Then, after two decades of investigations, following up on thousands of leads and trying numerous DNA strategies and doing everything possible to figure out who this was and what happened. On September 23rd, 2019, investigators received a tip from a concerned citizen in Cape Coral, Florida, who said that a woman had been going around and telling people that she had actually killed a woman while she was living in Illinois. This person identified the woman as then 64-year-old Linda Sue LaRoche. Then, using her identity, and DNA comparison, they identified Racine County Jane Doe as 23-year-old Peggy Lynn Johnson. So first, let's discuss Linda Sue LaRoche. Linda LaRoche was a registered nurse and the owner of Guardian Correctional Care since 1997. 
Guardian Correctional provided medical services to jails in DeKalb County since 2000 and Boone County since 2006, both of which counties are in Illinois. The services she provided included staffing a jail with a nurse five days a week, having a doctor on call at all times, and paying for inmates' pharmaceutical and hospital bills. And by all accounts, she did an acceptable job at both counties. Both counties reported no inappropriate behavior from her, and they were happy with the services that she provided. By October of 2013, she moved from Illinois to Cape Coral, Florida, where she enjoyed a retirement community in the Gulf of Mexico, living inside of her $300,000 riverfront home. She considered herself at least partially retired since 2013, even though she did still go to some meetings in Illinois. In Florida, her and her then-husband owned five properties in Lee County, three of which were in Cape Coral, and then two of them were in Fort Myers, and all of the properties added up to a value of $700,000. She also owned a $41,000 Mercedes, which she crashed that same year in 2019 while she was drunk driving. So now let's talk about Peggy Lynn Johnson. Peggy was born to her mother, Diane Schroeder, and a father, Scott Johnson, and grew up in McHenry, Illinois. However, when Peggy was growing up, those around her actually knew her as Peggy Schroeder because her father was not in the picture. She also had one brother named Jesse. Now, Diane worked in a nursing home, and the family was described as being a lower-class family with not a lot of stability, and they pretty much just scraped by as a family. Then, unfortunately, Diane actually passed away in November of 19. 1994 at the age of 41 when Peggy was only 18 years old. Then her brother Jesse died in the year of 1998, only a year before Peggy met the same fate. Unfortunately, I was not able to find the cause of death of either Jesse or Diane. Friends and classmates described Peggy as very quiet. She did always seem happy and had a smile on her face, but she never really spoke up or said anything. She was a very sweet and caring girl and wouldn't even hurt a fly. Peggy went to Harvard High School in Harvard, Illinois, which was about 20 miles west of McHenry. However, nearing the end of her high school career, classmates recalled that Peggy sort of fell off the radar after her her mother had died. Friends said that the last time that they saw Peggy was at the homecoming dance at school in 1994. At that point, friends and classmates didn't really know what happened to Peggy, but they had heard that she went back to live in McHenry, which is where she grew up, so they weren't too concerned. So there Peggy was in 1994, 18 years old. She did have a cognitive disability. She lost her mother, and she didn't have a father in the picture, and she was homeless. She didn't really seem comfortable confiding and her friends because according to them, they're not sure why Peggy didn't go to them to let them know what was going on. They knew that her mother was died and that she had fallen off the radar and obviously, naturally, she wasn't in a very good headspace because she was mourning the death of her mother, but she seemed like she was doing okay in McHenry. So because of all of this, Peggy went out searching for help at a medical clinic in McHenry, Illinois. There, she met a seemingly nice registered nurse named Linda LaRoche, who recognized that Peggy had a cognitive disability and willingly took her into her own home. This was under the agreement that Peggy would work for her as a nanny and a housekeeper in exchange for housing and food. Now, at the time, Linda was married and had five children. Her husband and three children lived in the home with her and Peggy, while the other two children lived in different residences nearby. And here is when we learn about all of the horrific conditions under which Peggy suffered while living in the home with Linda from the year of 1994 until 1999. Now, after finding Linda, investigators got into contact with her family, and they recalled a lot of the treatment that Peggy had suffered. According to Linda's husband and children, Peggy was forced to sleep in the crawl space under the home. Linda would also scream at her pretty much every single day, and in their words, she treated her like an animal. As we saw from before, she was very clearly malnourished and was not being fed the proper amount. Now, her family said that they noticed some signs of physical abuse on Peggy, but as far as I saw, it seemed like they didn't actually see most of it happening. One of the children said that they asked Peggy about a black eye that she had, and that Peggy actually confided in them and told them about what was going on, and told them that Linda had punched her in the face. They also saw on some occasions that Peggy was slapped in the face and head, and one of them also said that she had stabbed Peggy in the head with a pitchfork. But as we saw from the autopsy that is not even close to the amount of physical abuse that she endured for five 
years. Now, at the time of Peggy's death, like I said, Linda was working at the jail. Apparently, these jails did not have facilities to store drugs, so Linda admitted that she had been storing these medications in the crawl space in her home in McHenry. So then, when Linda was questioned, she admitted to almost everything. She did admit to abusing Peggy, but she told them that Peggy would steal from her. They said that she would have men at the house all of the time and that she would go into the crawl space willingly to steal a bunch of the medication that Linda had under there. And then, of course, police questioned Linda about the events that occurred leading to Peggy's death. So Linda said that she had gotten home one day and saw that Peggy was standing at the kitchen counter with a bottle of pills in hand. Linda asked Peggy what she was doing and Peggy just dumped all the pills down the kitchen drain. At that point, I guess Peggy fainted, so Linda took her outside to get some fresh air. At that point, Linda said that she did not know what to do. She said that she thought about calling an ambulance but ultimately decided not to even though she is literally a nurse and is paid to deal with this type of situation for a living, but she ultimately did not call an ambulance. Linda claimed that her husband was actually at home at the time that all of this was happening. She said that she asked him to take the kids out for ice cream because this was going to be traumatic for them. During this, Peggy was still laying there and her eyes were fluttering, but then she eventually woke up. Linda said that it was at this point that she decided and realized that she could not deal with Peggy anymore. She said she then took Peggy to a phone booth at a nearby gas station. She told Peggy to call her grandmother and then drove to a nearby restaurant so that Peggy could meet up with her grandmother. She said she had turned Peggy over to her grandmother and that she hadn't seen Peggy ever since. But there was a problem with this recount of the story. They questioned Peggy's grandmother and she told them that she had never never once met with Linda or Linda's husband. So then Linda changed the story once again and said that she did drop Peggy off with someone, but she wasn't exactly sure who. But then by November 6th, 2019, she finally admitted that she didn't drop her off with anybody and said that Peggy had actually overdosed on those pills. So then she drove Peggy's body to Wisconsin and then let her out in a rural area and then left her on the side of the road. But she insisted that Peggy was was not injured when she dropped her off and that something must have happened after she dropped her off in Racine County. But not only did the autopsy contradict her claims that she was not injured when she was left on the side of the road, but it also showed that she had zero trace of any drugs in her system, which contradicted the claim that she had overdosed on any sort of pills. So obviously, Linda is not telling the full truth. It's obvious that she's lying about at least something because autopsies don't lie. I also want to mention that according to Linda's now ex-husband, he actually got home from work and just saw Peggy laying there passed out on the floor, to which Linda said that she overdosed on pills when he asked her what had happened. So he claims that he was not home during all of this. Now, I will say that most stories that people tell do stem from a bit of truth. So I do think that Linda was true truly getting tired of taking care of Peggy, but I don't believe that her behavior was as bad as Linda says. I don't think she was stealing drugs because as we saw, there were absolutely none in her system. Maybe she was bringing boys home, but who cares? She's literally in her 20s. That's what girls in their 20s do. I don't see anything wrong with that. But then we also have to remember that Peggy did have a cognitive disability. Now, I don't know exactly what kind of cognitive disability she had. It's not stated anywhere exactly what she was diagnosed with, if anything. I'm also not going to try and guess because I personally find that disrespectful. But no matter what her diagnosis may be, working with individuals with mental disabilities is very challenging no matter what diagnosis they have. It's just not for everybody and that is just a fact. And that is coming from me who is literally going to school right now, learning how to medically treat and help children with disabilities of all kinds. And again, it's not easy. And I will be the first person to say that if you're not patient and you can't handle children or children with disabilities in general or adults with disabilities, you should not go into this kind of medical field. But either way, you would think that someone who literally went to school to learn how to treat everybody and provide care for everybody, including those with disabilities, 
would have been prepared to know how to work with Peggy. Plus, she is the one who recognized Peggy's disability and willingly took her into her home and chose to work with her. But either way, I imagine that Peggy probably did have some sort of behavioral issues, whether they were mild or severe, whether it be hypersensitivity from different environments and stimuli or just not understanding how to respond in certain situations. It's common for those with cognitive difficulties to respond to situations differently than neurotypical people would respond. Many people see these responses as tantrums or acting out when in reality, sometimes people just don't know how to respond to certain situations. So again, I feel like maybe Peggy did have either mild or severe behavioral issues, but I think that Linda got tired of dealing with Peggy. And then I think despite her cognitive disability, Linda may have been punishing her physically for acting out or maybe even just not listening to her as perfectly and consistently as she wanted to, or maybe Linda just punished her physically because she wanted to. I have no idea. But either way, it was very evident that she was being physically harmed from the years and years and years of physical abuse. Again, she probably punished Peggy every single time she reacted in a way that she didn't like. I think she probably beat Peggy to death, whether unintentional or intentional, I'm not exactly sure, but I think that she probably realized that she beat her unconscious and then drove her to Wisconsin, maybe even while she was still alive because according to the road rash that was evident from her dragging her out there, it seemed like it was pre-mortem, but it could have been post-mortem, I'm not exactly sure, but Either way, I think that she probably beat her unconscious and then drove her out to Wisconsin, dragged her out in that field, and just left her there. And I also do want to mention again that the person who called in concerned about what Linda was saying said that Linda herself admitted that she had killed someone, so it almost makes me wonder if it was intentional, but again, I'm not sure. As of right now, Linda is being charged with first-degree intentional homicide and concealment of a corpse, with the max penalty being life in prison. As of right now, that is where the case stands, and I honestly don't know where this case is going to go after this. I don't know if she's going to admit to exactly what she did, but even if she doesn't, we pretty much know exactly what happened. Now we can see exactly why she was never reported missing. She didn't have a mother, she didn't have a father who was in the picture, and her brother died. According to some friends and classmates, they actually did try reaching out to Peggy when they found out that she was living with the LaRoche family, but they were never able to get a hold of her. Apparently, there was one who knocked on the door and Linda answered, and I don't remember if Linda said that Peggy didn't live there or she just wasn't available, but none of her friends and classmates thought anything weird of this. Also, of course, after graduating high school, people go on and they have families and they have their own careers. They lose touch with their old high school friends and classmates, so they didn't just jump to assuming that she was murdered when they couldn't get a hold of her. Unfortunately, she just slipped through the cracks. She was failed by multiple people, including Linda's husband, who had every opportunity, in my opinion, to stop the abuse. Throughout reading this entire case, I could not figure out why her husband didn't say anything. I saw that after she got arrested, he filed for divorce, but I don't think it's because he suddenly found out that she's this horrific person. He knew this entire time what she did. He himself said that he noticed signs of physical abuse, saw how badly she was verbally abused by her, and saw that she was forced to sleep in the crawl space. So he knew. Now I do understand why the children wouldn't have wanted to say anything, and that's a very common dynamic that we see in a lot of abuse cases. I don't exactly know how old Linda's children were that were living at the home, but it's very possible that the other children living with her were afraid of being hit themselves, so they didn't want to say anything to make the parent upset. I don't know if these children tried helping Peggy while she was there. I don't know if they stood up for her or if they just kind of sat back. I don't know if they tried getting help for Peggy. I honestly have no idea, but I do understand why the children wouldn't really have said anything, but the husband absolutely zero excuse. I am really, really happy that we finally found the identity of Racine County Jane Doe. This was such a big case for such a long time, and now we finally know her name. 
Peggy Lynn Johnson. In December of last year, her headstone was replaced with a proper headstone that says her full name, Peggy Lynn Johnson Schroeder. This case is all just so horrific and I can't even begin to understand how this all happened. I can't believe such a beautiful young soul was met with such a horrific end. Her mother had just died and she was in such a vulnerable place and Linda saw that and just used that to take advantage of her. It was her choice to take Peggy in and the second she realized she couldn't handle her, she should have just helped her go somewhere else. She should have actually had her call her grandmother like she said she did, but she didn't. Instead, she just took her life from her and I don't even know what to say about that. It's just horrific. She obviously did not deserve what happened to her. It's just such a sad case that was just unknown for two decades and Linda got to go out and live her life to her fullest for 20 years before she had to take accountability for what she did and honestly I have no idea how her husband lived with her for all of that time and never said anything. I also don't know how her children could have gone on and obviously like I said earlier the ones who lived with her I could understand why they didn't say anything at the time but they're adults now. They could have said something this entire time, but no one did. And I have no idea why. And maybe through a trial, we'll figure out exactly why. I don't know if there'll be a trial. I don't know if she's ever going to come out and say anything or if the husband and children are ever going to come out and say anything else. But it's just horrific and I can't even begin to understand it. Thank you. God for that concerned citizen who took the responsibility of calling this in. We definitely need more people like this person in our society who will take the responsibility of calling in when they hear something suspicious. This person was the reason that this case finally found justice and why we finally have a name for Racine County Jane Doe. So that is where I'm going to end today's video. I hope you enjoyed learning about these two different cases that were solved so many years later. It really is horrible to hear about what happened to these two beautiful young women and I'm referring to Andrea Bowman as well as um, Peggy Lynn Johnson, but it's also nice to discuss some of these cases that do have some closure and some justice. So with that, if you did like today's video, make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put up new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Also, don't forget to turn the notifications to on if you wish to be notified of any future videos. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!